This is the Monday, March 20th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, wet side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine picks up a man who never really existed. His story had me thinking of the World War II true spy story, The Man Who Never Was, about Operation Mincemeat, meant to deceive the Nazis about the D-Day landings by inventing an officer and letting the Nazis find him. Today... We'll call our guest by the name he's carried for 40 years, Jack Barsky, because that's the name on the cover of his book. But he was born Albrecht Dietrich in East Germany, then a country of its own behind the Iron Curtain. Young Albrecht grew up on a steady diet of communist doctrine, with a keen analytical mind and a knack for language. Those talents and others soon caught the eye of the KGB, and our man gave up a teaching career and took on a mission to infiltrate the United States, which he had been taught was the ultimate enemy of mankind and a successor to Hitler's Nazi Germany. On October 8, 1978, a man claiming to be a Canadian national named William Dyson passed through U.S. Customs at Chicago O'Hare Airport and days later evaporated into thin air. The man traveling under that alias next assumed the identity of Jack Barsky, a Maryland-born child who died in 1955. In the decades since, the man who had been Dietrich, then Dyson, then Barsky, and so many others in between, has had a life with all the twists and turns you'd expect from a fictional spy thriller. But his story is very true, and the trip he took is one I really enjoyed taking with him. From ardent communist to patriotic American citizen, from unquestioning atheist to agnostic to the witnessing Christian he is today, from the spy game and risking his life to a career in IT and as a public speaker, from a life of lies and emptiness in service to the myth of Soviet utopia to a chance to pursue happiness and the American dream. Jack's book is titled Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America. Visit him online at jackbarsky.com. That last name is B-A-R-S-K-Y. Jack's book refused any attempt at skimming ahead to the good parts, because they're all good parts. I hung on every word, devouring this first-person history of the Cold War that made me think of that quaintly outdated song by the police, Russians, in which Sting intones, I hope the Russians love their children too. Okay. Now that we've read the dossier, let's travel back to the Cold War with Jack Barsky and go deep undercover. I'm on the line with Jack Barsky, author of Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America. Jack, your book is such a full one. We've just talked maybe for 20 minutes here before we even hit record because you're a guy that is a natural storyteller, I would say. Your book encompasses post-World War II life in East Germany and New York City in the Reagan years. It's a wide scope. You write about the USSR's fundamental misunderstanding and fear of Ronald Reagan. You see the fall of the Berlin Wall, the disillusion of the Soviet Union, it's like you're chatting about seven books with us today, so I really want to thank you for making the time to do just that here on the History Author Show. 
Well, Dean, it's a pleasure talking with you. Now that I'm able to actually, you know, disclose everything that I kept secret for such a long time, I actually like talking. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. That must be a unique experience to be able to finally talk about it. It's something that we're definitely going to get into and you cover in the book how your so many of your attitudes have to change as well as when you're changing your name and your cover stories. What drew me into Deep Undercover is those powers of self-reflection you have and the honesty about your shortcomings as well as the things that you're doing. That's something you just displayed right there. A lot of people just wouldn't notice maybe that it felt good suddenly to be speaking about it. But there's one thing that as a spy, you were unable to do, and that is write things down. You wouldn't be making notes. You certainly wouldn't be talking out inner conflicts. In fact, you're trained to forget your double life. Once you rip up that passport with a fake name on it and flush it down the toilet, that's gone. So I wonder how you dug up so many of the details you include in this memoir. Yeah, that's a really good question. Not only did I not write things down, but I also didn't take pictures So there's a dearth of pictures during my 15 years during which I was associated with the KGB, which was real sort of funny in some way. When I did my zigzag travels to go to the United States and back, you know, as a tourist, I got to see a lot of interesting places, but quite frankly, I was never there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I didn't take any pictures. I have no, no collected memories. Now, here's the deal. Uh, I have naturally a pretty good memory. But when I started actually thinking about, reflecting about my life, this was like when you take a big box and it says 2,000 pieces of a puzzle and start working on it. And it's initially it looks like it's you, you won't be able to get it. And so bits and pieces, you start putting it together and you start double checking. And thanks to the internet, there was a lot of ability for me to cross check, to even look at places where I grew up Google Maps, for instance, shook loose more memories. Then I had the ability to talk to my now friend, Joe Riley, the fellow who led the investigation on the FBI side, who contributed bits and pieces. My German son contributed bits and pieces. And before you knew it, you know, I had a pretty decent puzzle with a few pieces missing, but to a point where I said, well, I remember pretty well. Oh, by the way, when I first was approached by the media, which was the German Der Spiegel, it took me about six weeks to come up with a timeline as to what happened when and where. So that's a long answer to your brief question. I'm pretty convinced that what I put down in the book is pretty accurate. You even had one moment there, speaking of photographs, where I believe you're with one of your KGB handlers or contacts and somebody tries to take a picture. And that's a stressful moment there in the book because nobody wants a picture taken of them. And yet you can't just duck behind a tree. That's a little bit suspicious, right? So there's, there's a lot of real life moments here in your story. Yes. And, and that someone was my mother who had come to visit. She was a tourist while I was in Moscow. I had come to also visit me in order to you know keep my secret secret. My handler, Sergei, was helping out and he was he acted as a tourist guy to detract them from the fact that I really didn't work as a diplomat in the embassy. And as we were walking around in, in, in Moscow, she said, hey, why don't we let her have a picture taken? Her husband took the picture and Sergei, who was visibly uncomfortable, couldn't wiggle out of that one. <laughs> and neither could I. And that is the only picture that I've ever had jointly with an employee of the KGB. You open the book, speaking of your mother, with stories of how your parents treated you when you were sick or injured growing up. Keep in mind, they'd just gone through World War II, requiring them to be tough. They knew what it was going to take to survive. So let's start with those days in East Germany growing up. How did those lessons to ignore pain and suppress your emotions and be tough advance your career as a spy, and tell us a little about the price you pay for that in other endeavors of life. All right, so this is a twofold question. Let me just go briefly into the childhood. First of all, I am not angry, bitter, or disappointed in the way my parents treated me as a child. They didn't know any better, and it it was a sign of the times. But at the same time, that kind of treatment resulted in significantly hardening me to not only physical pain, but also emotional pain. And that is one of the fundamental prerequisites of surviving sort of as a lone wolf 
in uh, enemy territory, particularly the psychological aspect. By the way, I still tell people I had a happy childhood. I didn't know any better that I was missing something. Hmm. So when you learn as a child that, you know, love is unattainable, you know, you take it for granted. And love is the one thing that can upset the apple cart significantly, as people will find out if they read my book. I know there's that one moment where your mother, for instance, I could see from her perspective, maybe just thought you'd grown up and she didn't need to give you a kiss anymore because that's what you say to her, right? I'm grown up now, but you're kidding, right, at the time when you say that. So how does that affect you? What's the price you pay in your other personal relationships? Well, the price I paid is that the bottom line is that there is a, an intrinsic need for human beings to love and be loved. And I, for quite a while, with some exceptions that were more or less on the surface, I denied that. And that eventually led to a crisis later on in life that led me into the arms of God. But I think we're jumping a little bit ahead here. The price I paid, essentially, that I lived without real love for a significant part of my life. You are recruited once you grow up here a little bit. You go to school. You have a line in Deep Undercover. You only say no to the party once here, meaning the Communist Party. Talk about how the KGB recruits you and what made you resolve you'd leave everything behind for years at a time, your mother, your wife, your child, and serve the state. Well, that line, I think, uh, was in the context of my father being offered uh, a better job. And I'm quoting him of, of having said that. And that fundamentally meant that, you know, if the party calls you and it seems to be a better position and you say no, they're not going to offer you one once again. Now, I have to tell the listeners that my saying yes to the KGB was entirely voluntary. I was not afraid of saying no. Up to a certain moment, I could have said no without any damage because here's the bottom line. The kind of work that they were recruiting me for requires somebody to engage in it voluntarily. If you are forced into it, I can see that for somebody who was already in a position where they have secrets and you blackmail them, you can force them. But for somebody who would go, quote unquote, into enemy territory and be an independent operator, they have to be voluntary. So I wasn't afraid of saying no, but I was hesitant to say yes. The reason I ultimately did say yes was A, ideology, B, the appeal by what I thought at the time was the most powerful organization on earth, the appeal that this offer made to me, that I was going to be somebody special. There's an organization that in, in their own way extended love and appreciation to me, and I felt special, very important to somebody with a big ego at my age. And certainly the sense of adventure. I always had a bit of a sense of adventure. You put this all together, I call this the trifecta, that eventually, you know, put me over the line. It was close because I loved where I was. I loved my job and I, I loved being a member of a great basketball team. But what I didn't have, going back to the love angle, I didn't have a love in my life at that time that would have held me back in Germany. So with that, the trifecta went over and that's why how I wound up saying yes to the KGB. So you take the job, come over to the U.S. in the 70s. You're training, though, before that to pass as an American. There's no Internet, no DVDs. There's a lot of myths about American life swirling around behind the Iron Curtain. Small slip ups like being amazed by screw top beer when you're initially deployed. It's funny looking back or you get that first pair of blue jeans. I think you're 28 years old. Those things could cost you your life. So I wondered, with the benefit of hindsight, as an analytical mind, somebody who's been in IT now, how would you improve the training the KGB gave you if you could go back and advise them on your younger self? How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> if I had gone back when they called me back, I would have had significant value to them as a consultant. This is what I tell people to make it clear what the problem was in a nutshell. I was trained, briefed by folks who had spent time in the United States as legal residents, KGB employees who worked for the United Nations or embassy or whatever, and a couple of individuals who had been citizens of the United States, but had left that country 
like 20 years prior. So fundamentally what the situation turned out to be that I was trained by folks who recently looked from the outside in as if you were looking at an aquarium studying fish and they were trying to teach me how to be a fish. Hmm. They couldn't. So the training ultimately took place on the job, so to speak. And I was really fortunate that my first social interaction in the United States was in a messenger service office where all the folks who worked there didn't give a damn where you came from, where you were going, what your story was. But, you know, I was just listening and observing and, and slowly adopting the New York slash American way of life in addition to watching a lot of television. For instance, things that are local to me are strictly American, such as, you know, I would never think of eating a slice of pizza with a knife and fork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, the only way I learned is you take the damn thing and you fold it up and eat it yeah. with your hand. Our current mayor still has struggles with that, has yet to master it. That <laughs> I thought they were going to throw him out of office when they caught him with a knife and fork his first week or so, whatever it was. But uh, he's come around since then. But it's true, little things like that. But also, I think you walk the city as you do in Deep Undercover. You describe that, and you are welcomed in. I think it's a unique place. I wonder if you ever thought how it would have been going the other way. I think for somebody from here to go over to a closed society like East Germany at the time, there would have been many of those moments that probably would have just sunk them. I, I can't imagine going the other way. That would have been very different. I would think it's nearly impossible. One could think of, let's say, somebody who was nearly perfect in German or Russian to get somehow a start in as an undercover person in Moscow or in Berlin and East Berlin. But you're right about a closed society. I think Americans uh, knew even less about Russians than vice versa, because information just wouldn't get out. And, you know, you would trip up left, right and center. And there was a whole lot more eyes watching you, watching the different, different behaviors. In New York, you know, nobody pays attention to whatever behavior because it's not unique. Right. In New York, <laughs> anything goes. Yeah, it's a point of pride. It, it was an ideal place for you to come, really, when you think about it. New Yorkers take pride in ignoring the crazy thing going on. That really benefits you here as a spy trying to come here and blend in. You maybe just seem a little quirky. Everyone's not suspicious of you. You're able to find your own way. And that's kind of what seduces you here a little bit, for lack of a better word, and makes you want to throw in, become a native. People are just friendly to you, it seems. Yes, but that really didn't start until I had a quote-unquote real job, my professional job as a programmer which took close to five years for me to get into. Up until then, my existence was somewhat marginal as a bike messenger, a part-time bike messenger and student. You know, I was a little bit on the fringes, you know, not only as a bike messenger, you know, this was a pretty low-level type job, but as a student, I was 10 years older than my mm-hmm. fellow students, and you know, I lived alone, so I didn't have much of a social life. This changed when I dove into corporate America and all of a sudden was a member of a large team. You go to work at an insurance company. You said that was the most demonized company. And here you are, you end up working for a big company on there in the insurance and you find out, hey, it's actually pretty nice. Yeah, it was sort of the Pentagon, the military industrial complex and banks and insurance companies. They were the personification of capitalist evil, as, as it was uh, taught to us in East Germany. One of your assignments early on is to meet with Zbigniew Brzezinski, President Carter's national security advisor, which made me chuckle. It seems like they thought you would just see him, right, walking down the street or something. <laughs> you would just befriend him somehow. Well, this was kind of odd the way I was launched. I didn't get very specific tasks. We were daydreaming and thinking about it would be really great and if you could get in touch or get close to one of those conservative think tanks. And oh, by the way, we were really interested in the Trilateral Commission, Rockefeller and Brzezinski and the Institute of Foreign Relations or some such title out of Colombia that was headed by Brzezinski, who at the time was the national security advisor for Jimmy Carter. The Russians had a big problem in the direction of human rights coming out of the Carter administration. And they didn't like at all Brzezinski and how he, you know, how he pushed for that. Now, here's the problem. 
how do you as a bike messenger or a student or even as a junior programmer <laughs> get to somebody of that stature? So, you know, I tried to attend a few events at Columbia University, but it didn't get me very far because I didn't have a really good reason to be there. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't like the master networker who could just like worm his way into any kind of a situation to eventually wind up friends with a lot of people. I had to always be aware that I needed to be consistent with my cover story, consistent with my background. So I couldn't just pretend to be X, Y, Z when that easily uh, could be uncovered to be a lie. So it, that was fundamentally a task that I could not have achieved, not in the time frame that I was operating. I wonder with a name like his, us being in the word business, did you ever worry about giving yourself away by pronouncing a name like that properly, let's say, or picking up a German word? Or for instance, if somebody shouted something in German and you're not supposed to know German, you might react to it. How did you train yourself that way? Or did you ever purposely say mispronounce a German name or a German word when you were in a high stress situation to avoid it? That's an excellent question. Not only has it never been asked, it never occurred to me to even think about it. <laughs> you know, in hindsight, that was a vulnerability, not so much the German. I cut the German out of my existence radically and with extreme prejudice. That was not a problem. Within about six months of me being here, I started dreaming in English. However, I do believe that I did not manage to pronounce foreign names with a American accent. I'm somewhat familiar with French, Spanish, and Russian, and that includes all the other languages. You know, I always prided myself on saying things correctly. That was actually a mistake. Yeah. You should have told me earlier. <laughs> well, in 1977 with my Schwinn bike, I could have written by, ridden by. I might have seen you, bike messenger. Maybe uh, I could have passed it along had I known this story. But <laughs> the amazing thing is nobody would know anything about you. People are speaking with you here in the course of Deep Undercover, and they're talking about geopolitics and Russia and talking about Reagan and how the Soviet Union views him. And that's all flying on the wall stuff. People get to experience that with you. All very inside things. Deep Undercover, really a perfect name for it. Mm -hmm. My guest is Jack Barsky, author of Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB spy in America. Find him online at jackbarsky.com. Joe Weisberg, creator of the Americans TV show on FX, wrote, quote, Equal Parts Memoir, Spycraft Guide, and Historical Document, Deep Undercover perfectly describes the crippling insularity of a spy's life, unquote. Jack, I'm always interested in how people who live through events react to dramatized depictions on screen. What do shows like The Americans and Hollywood at large get right about your life as a KGB spy? And are there any moments over the years that have made you laugh out loud because they're just so unrealistic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much of Hollywood is just to me is a comedy because it's so unreal. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Much of what is written in literature, novels, while they might be very readable and exciting and wonderful, completely off with regard to reality. The only author who I really think got it right is John le Carré. Mm. With regard to realistic treatment, I think the Americans have come as close as possible, particularly when it comes to the psychology of being undercover. And, you know, when Mr. Wiseman says crippling insularity of a spy's life, he caught that very well. So the Americans, the producers know what they're doing. They really like the psychological aspect of their show, but they also need to entertain. Mm -hmm. And so 80% entertainment, this is what people like, is fast moving, blah, blah, blah. The real life of an undercover agent is like rather boring and mostly feels like watching paint dry. Uh, <laughs> two things that make me laugh out loud. One of them comes out of the Americans when the undercover people run around with wigs on their heads. <laughs> now, every, t every time I see one of the two with a wig, I'm saying, you can't do that. <laughs> Simply because if you're recognized as having worn a wig once, you're dead. 
you know, you just can't do it. The other one that makes me laugh out loud is because I know information technology. When in spy movies they show that somebody getting on a computer and typing things in and real fast, and then there's these characters flying across, and then somebody says, I got it, we got it in. <laughs> this is total nonsense. It doesn't happen like that. Espionage and counterintelligence in the cyberspace is very meticulous and takes a lot of time and is not something you can actually film and, and get somebody to watch and be entertained by it. Well, the closest we can come to the real story is Deep Undercover. I just have to say it, not because I really liked your book or I'm forcing it on anybody, but that's what occurs to me. You really did a great editing job here. I know you had help in that regard, but this book really does read like that. It's not an insult to it as it may sound sometimes or condescending to say it reads like a spy novel. For people interested in the real history of what the life was like, this explains that. You can look at something like The Americans and say, for me anyway, Carrie Russell wearing a wig just looks like Carrie Russell wearing a wig. She stands out. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like she, the guy's a little bit more kind of the everyman character, but the real life moments are things like that the screw top beer. Right. You know, you're blown away when you're handed that. That's just as stressful, but it's something that comes across here in print and TV. You'd probably just look ridiculous. But when you hear the inside of the person, you're saying, oh my gosh, I, I learned something from that. That's one thing your handlers did get right. They send you to Canada first, America right. Junior, as they call it in the Simpsons. Right. I give you another real life moment, real briefly. It happened to me once in Finland. I was to meet with a resident agent there to get my passport and some travel money to fly into Moscow. And we had these phrases to recognize each other. And the fellow didn't speak any English. And he butchered the phrase so much that it was <laughs> beyond recognition. The only thing is that when you're supposed to meet somebody at a certain spot at 315, you actually don't need the, that phrase. You know right away who, who it is. <laughs> it's like a blind date. You know, you look around and say, oh. That must be it. Yeah. Or she or her. Yeah. So anyway. Sort of the opposite of that thing about saying the language perfectly. You've got to be able to speak it to some extent. Otherwise, all these things could have screwed you up that one time they book you on the Concord, don't they? That's incredible. You're supposed to be a bike messenger, I think, at the time, right? Yes, I was. Uh, <laughs> I was not yet a professional. And, uh, you know, with a little more alertness, Air France could have alerted the uh, French police who could have said, hey, to the Americans, check this guy out. He may be a you know, criminal, drug smuggler, whatever. This is an unusual person. You know, I sweat at that one. <laughs> I'll sweat at the speed of sound for your next book. There you <laughs> go. Take that title. But yeah, these are the things that do also become obvious in the book. I know when I read books on somebody like George Washington or a biography of Churchill, who very much believed this, I talked to Jonathan Sands, Churchill's great-grandson who wrote a book, God and Churchill, he begins to see this pattern in his life, Churchill, of God looking out for him. And this is something that we get to here in your book. You start to become open to that. And that's a fascinating journey as well. As I said, many books here layered into one in Deep Undercover. A key moment in that transformation, a signpost maybe, is when you graduate at the top of that college class in New York City and you learn you have to give a valedictory speech. That's not exactly low profile for a spy. It's sort of like flying the Concord was. You don't want to be in the papers. But before you give the speech, as you're writing it, you find that at this job, you've begun to open up to capitalism. You're living its benefits. You're working with Americans. You're understanding it as a system. And so in that vein, your journey to Christ begins because you're around Christians and you see that they're not these caricatures that you grew up hearing about in the Eastern Bloc or that you thought of. So I wonder if you'd compare and contrast or run parallel for us those two conversions to your heart kind of opening up there. Well, actually, they're quite different. You know, my embrace of a free society and capitalism that sort of crept up on me. It wasn't something I sought. It wasn't even something I was overly aware of. It was just as I became more American, it was more and more natural. As opposed to my conversion to Christianity, there was a need. I got to a point where, you know, I was in crisis. I was uh, at, a, at a point in my life where I didn't know what else to do with it because my children were moving out of the house. My marriage was on the rocks. 
and I said to friends, I says, I'm done. I have, you know, I don't want to spend the rest of my life just playing golf. What else is left? And then I get this person entering my life, who is now my wife, who introduced me to Jesus. You know, and initially that was like, okay, I hope she she doesn't try to convert me. But, you know, I was open to discussion. And before you know it, she sort of uh, roped me in. Very deliberately, by the way. Mm-hmm. But you didn't know it at <laughs> the time. I didn't know it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that comes across definitely in the book. You're basically thinking, I hope she's not going to be handling snakes. I mean, this is what you've been raised, that kind of thinking. The Bible is forbidden fruit until you meet Shauna. You haven't picked one up since you were a child, a very young child. I think you're, what, 8, 9, 10, 11? This is absolutely correct. This is a true statement, and you follow her example. In fact, you said there, I hope she doesn't convert me. You state that to her flat out, and she's just right there. I mean, I think that that's a sign of a of a great person in a relationship, whatever it is. I have a friend, and he tends to get very, very worked up, and he married a girl who's very tiny. And we were out with them one night, and he was saying one of her friends had been offensive. This is about 10 years ago. And he was in the right. But he was being overbearing. And when you're tall, I'm a tall, big guy. I try to be conscious of this. He's leaning over her. And she was just letting it wash over her. And I said to my wife after, that's really good. She's good for him. She kept calm, even tones, you know, let that wash over. And she was concentrating on the important thing. And I pictured that here with Shauna when she says that to you. Uh, you're not being offensive to her. You're just saying, you know, I'm, I'm not into that. And she says, okay, I'm not into missionary dating almost. That's not the phrase she uses. But she just is living by an example. And I wonder if following Shauna's example, you have any advice for Christians Christians who maybe want to reach out to a person they care about that they see drinking the bottle of wine every night, trying to fill up the hole inside them, the lack of love with bourbon, or maybe who don't understand why they do turn people off by being a little bit too enthusiastic. By Shauna's example, how can you tell us how to reach people who are closed off and how to be a positive example for them? Well, you said a key word here, example. First of all, you have to show others what it is like to be a real Christian, and that's behavior. It's day in, day out. It's consistent. It's how you treat others and how you actually let things go. As you just stated that example of that vertically challenged person, let some things go because they're not important. When you're faced with anger, you respond with love. Not easy at all, but that's how it starts. That's how you get credibility. The next step is very much dependent on the situation. It's situational. It also depends on the personality that you're dealing with. So Shauna, for instance, knew that she had to capture my mind before my heart would follow. And so she introduced me to Ravi Zacharias' radio show, Let My People Think. That was a huge first step, you know, because I had always thought and I was taught early on that you know, Christianity is for two types of people. They're either stupid or they're very much in need. Well, the second one is actually somewhat true, but I put this down to like being in need, you know, as being equal to, you know, just being not capable of taking care of oneself. Well, I didn't know that I was in need. And the fundamental truth nowadays is, and this is how you can pretty much grab everybody, There is fundamentally no human being who is not in need of love and who is not in need of finding peace and to some extent also finding the answers of why we're here and where we're going and what this is all about. Now, when it comes to, you know, working with an individual, you have to like approach that individual with these things in mind, but, you know, you hook them based on whatever conversations will lead you. Again, there's, there's, I guarantee you there is no formula that you can use. Jesus himself didn't use formula. <laughs> That's true. I never thought of that. I did like that one thing she did was she sees clearly sensing that you're a helper. You're a person who likes to help people and you like to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So she comes to you and says that she's writing, what is it, a dissertation? It's something like that or an article? No, it was was college papers. Okay, college paper. And so you help her 
And then you say, well, I guess I have to actually know what I'm reading about. I think it's the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. Yeah. And so that's kind of your gateway there. And you're letting yourself be open to that. And you see all those pictures together, strung together, makes a movie when you look at Deep Undercover. When you read your story, it's clear. But in the moment, that's not. And I thought that those are all things that I think, you know, we can learn from whatever we're trying to persuade somebody. We're trying to help somebody. That was really great. You're very blessed there and fortunate. I I thought that that was just the perfect person to be put in your life. Yes. And you just said something pretty profound. In hindsight, when you look at this from the outside, you can see a pattern. While you're going through it, you don't see it. Mm -hmm. It's not obvious to you, but, but clearly there was a pattern And to me, that can be attributed to some degree of divine intervention. Now, we're not puppets, but there's a leading hand of God in my life for sure that I can see all over the place, which I didn't see when I was living it. Now you see it just like those signs they would paint, right? The chalk marks on the lampposts and the other things, (laughs) right? And you you come to ignore them at the end. They tell you to come home and you say, well, I I don't want to go home. I I want to stay. I have a life here. You have a child. That's what makes that big difference at that time. So like a flip book, if you look at one of those cells from Bugs Bunny, you can't necessarily tell what he's doing, but you watch the whole thing and then you see it becomes a, a story. It becomes a cartoon. There's action and things happen. Towards the end of this story, we have Joe Riley. You mentioned him earlier, now a golf buddy of yours. He writes the afterword of Deep Undercover. This is a, perhaps the most glaring example here of this as a book, unlike any other book. Who else writes a book about their life as a KGB spy in America and has the FBI special agent who caught them write the afterword of his book? But that's what Joe Riley does for you. And he says that the irony is America could use more citizens like you. Your first meeting and subsequent debriefings, of course, they weren't that cordial. I wonder if you would describe that moment you realize you are finally caught. Uh, According to Joe, my face went chalk white because I had put all of this out of my mind. I think it was seven years, at least seven years since I had said goodbye to the KGB. I pretty much knew, quote unquote, knew that the Russians wouldn't come after me and and the FBI had nothing on me so I could live out my life in obscurity. You know, living the American dream, having a nice little house, a family with two children, a good job, and that was it. And all of a sudden, the FBI shows up. And it was like, bam! (laughs) Hey, you're right back in it. Yep. And of course, at that point, you know, I have a pretty active mind at that point like uh, a thousand different thoughts in parallel were crossing through my head and trying to figure out okay what's next what's next what's next and the only thing that i could come up with at that point and that may be a survival skill my first question was am i under arrest because i wanted to figure out where i'm at and when the answer was no i said so what took you so long <laughs> this is by the way not an original but i didn't copy it there was a, another uh-huh. agent who was caught I think it was Eddie Fisher, and they finally caught up with him. He said the same thing. (laughs) You're kind of waiting, and also a little bit disarming. Like you said, survival tests. This is something you're trying to gauge these guys and see what's going to happen to you. But that was pure instinct. That was not Mm. uh, deliberate. It just came out without me thinking about it. But it helped. And then Riley said, well, this may not have to be the worst day in your life, but Those were all words. Fundamentally, for about six weeks, I didn't know where I was at. And it was a very stressful, arguably the most stressful six weeks in my entire life because I was not so much afraid for myself, but what would happen to my children. By the way, you casually said there that you said goodbye to the KGB. We talked earlier about saying no to the party before you go in. That would have been fine. But now you're in and they tell you to come back and you come up with an ingenious way. And I'm just going to leave that as a tease for people. The way that you decided to get them to just leave you alone and not expect you to come back was also a stroke of brilliance, brilliant instincts there. So I'll I'll leave that at that. And I hope people will pick up deep undercover and find out how you managed to do this because that that seems like the impossible, yes? They weren't going to just ever let anybody go. Yeah, it, you don't resign from the KGB, at least historically. That that was not a good proposition. <laughs> <laughs> While you were training, when you first get to America, you talked about watching shows. They were Alice, Gilligan's Island, Good Times, all shows I was watching too, by the way, when I was riding that Schwinn Stingray around. You were doing that to learn about American culture 
And I assume you caught at least a whiff of Star Trek in the episode where the Romulan tells Captain Kirk, in a different reality, I could have called you friend. I thought of that with Joe Riley here. He does become your friend. You're a very unique cultural exchange here. You're lucky enough to be able to live not a different life, but really two, three lives across the course of your journey here that you cover in the book. It reminded me of another line, Abraham Lincoln, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? Today, we have renewed tensions, the U.S., Germany, and Russia. There's this struggle all across our borders. I wondered what advice you can draw from having had loyalties to all three places. You have that unique perspective that maybe nobody else has. How can we smooth our way to better relationships and avoid those misunderstandings that could lead to war? Oh, boy. That's a big question. If I can start answering this on the personal level, not only am I good friends with Joe Riley, who at one point was clearly an enemy of mine, I also have a long, deep abiding friendship with a fellow who I was a colleague with for a while during my corporate career, who spent two years in Vietnam on his belly in the swamp while we were protesting the war. And if, and and I'm speculating, if, God forbid, there would have been a conscription and, you know, the East would have sent fighters into Vietnam, I would have not hesitated to shoot at him. And I love the guy. So when it comes to personal relationships, we need to overcome prejudice and really look inside as to what is inside the other person. Unfortunately, you know, human beings define themselves or are being defined based on the group or the society that they're attached to. And so so it happened that during World War II, you know, in, in Nazi Germany, a lot of Germans were actually willingly participating in the murder and extinction of millions of people. A lot of Russians did the same thing under Stalin. So I don't know if there's anything that can be done to relieve that kind of attention at the state nation level because there's a fine line between you know trying to play nice and appeasement you know just before world war ii the western europeans appeased hitler by giving him austria and a part of czechoslovakia and that didn't work so the question now is probably it wasn't asked but how do we deal with russia and china nowadays this is not This is above my pay grade. You know, I just don't know. (laughs) The bottom line is this is so much more complicated than personal relationships. Having said that, it is always good to have a personal relationship with leaders of, of another country. I think that can make a difference. When you talk about misunderstandings, if you know one another and you can just pick up the phone and talk to the other person and, and acknowledging, you know, their, your, interests that are sometimes diametrically opposed, at least that would create an ability to reduce tension. But, you know, the the dream that everybody will just live together peacefully, uh, only in heaven, man cannot achieve this on this earth. I don't believe so. I had one thought as I read Deep Undercover, and that's about the child who was born, Jack Barsky, in Maryland. He died not long before his 11th birthday in 1955. You mentioned that while they're trying to track you down here, the FBI visits the boy's mother, and I thought that must have brought up a lot of pain for her. That must have been something that shocked her. Somebody is out there using her name. She doesn't know who. And I wonder if you tried to make some amends for appropriating her son's name. Uh, The FBI actually talked to the parents, and initially they were shocked, but the FBI managed to convince them that if they kept quiet and uh, not, you know, go out in public and complain, uh, they would actually do a service to the country. This is all secondhand information. Mm. So I was told that they understood and let it rest. Both my fictitious parents have passed away since. I was never given information how to find them, and and as such, I was never able to get in touch with them. And I probably shouldn't have, because I'm not sure if that would have helped. It would have maybe opened the wounds even more. I have one final question for you. You start deep undercover with the warning coming from an agent who tracks you down. He's there on the subway and he says to you, you must come home or else you are dead. And you end the book with thank you, God. 
As I read about your journey to the Christian faith and through your unique life, I thought of the line in Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations, unquote. Now, you just said it's above your pay grade to talk about advising the nations on how to achieve that unachievable peace. But the reason that line jumped out at me is that you're the same man, the same soul behind all those aliases, all the fake dossiers, all the lies that you told in service to the KGB. They're still just you as a person. And now you stand before the whole world as an honest man, as a repentant man for the things that you've done in your life, personal and public. So I wonder, with that in mind, what do you hope readers will absorb when they get to that last line, thank you, God, in Deep Undercover? That's a really good question. And what I like is your recognition of the two bookends. You know, the beginning, that's a sentence that includes death. And at the end, I'm thanking God, affirming life. There are some historic and political, psychological slash political lessons that I am taking out of my life and I would like to share with whoever wants to listen and to some extent it's in the book but on a personal level I think this is more important to me it's a it's a personal journey and I I'm taking away two things that I would like to share with you your listeners as well as anybody who I get in touch with and it's number one is that goodness does not come from the inside because I always thought of myself as a good person. I always thought, you know, I had nothing but the best of intentions. And yet I wound up deliberately, purposely serving one of the most evil organizations, historically evil organization on the planet. So if I had God at the time I was recruited by the KGB, it is very likely that that I would have asked a few more questions and I would have wound up at least with doubt and rejected that overture. I think Ravi Zacharias is very good at pointing out this particular dilemma of mankind. Without God, we can't be moral. And that's number one. And number two is like, there's this, what people probably consider a trite sentence and it says, love conquers all. And that statement is probably as old as mankind was able to write things down because it you know there there are samples of it in ancient latin and and that fundamentally is the story of my life because while i really was deprived of love and deprived others ultimately my decision to stay in this country and defy the KGB at great risk was driven by love for a child. And then eventually I found what I had always been looking for and I couldn't get, and it was the love of Christ, which gives me tremendous peace and knowledge no matter what happens, he will not change it and take it away from me. And so there's a good reason why one of the most quoted verses in the Bible is out of John, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That is the essence of being Christian. So while I wasn't thinking about all of this, the last sentence, after I observed my child catching a fish he shouldn't have caught, which was miraculous in and of itself, (laughs) the last sentence, thanking God, ultimately, as I'm thinking back about this, is a perfect full stop to this story which is ultimately a love story played against the background of uh, undercover espionage. Well, Jack Barsky, author of Deep Undercover, I'm glad that you wrote this down and allowed us all to take this journey with you. I want to thank you for joining me today to discuss that story. We sincerely have only scratched the surface, everybody. Things like you trying to get a library card, things like you're almost being caught. There's a lot of great moments in this book. You lived a fascinating life. Thank you for writing it down for us so that we can all read it and become better people, too. So much more than just a spy novel. Again, maybe seven books in one. I hope I did my job and listeners will pick up the book and find out what you're all about. I wish you the best of luck with the book in the future. Thank you, sir. And when you say fascinating, it's not quite over and it's still (laughs) fascinating. And part of that is, you know, 
the ability to speak with people like you. Thank you very much. Well, the honor is all mine. Again, the book is Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will use those links or even navigate through the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com first, we take you to Amazon, and amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every dollar you spend at no extra charge in your shopping cart. For just a few extra clicks, you can help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. Once again, thanks to Jack Barsky for joining us and for sharing this journey unlike any other in the Cold War. Visit him online at jackbarsky.com. That last name is B-A-R-S-K-Y. Remember, you can let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. And have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. 